Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great pleasure that once again, I am privileged to introduce to our audience, Marty M., the first woman in AA. Thank you, Andy. You know, I think we ought to offer membership to the city of Jacksonville, don't you? That story of rehabilitation is something. Also, I was quite convinced that I had taken a plane trip and gone a long way from New York, and that I was in another part of the country. But looking at all this, and at all this, is this the United Nations, or is this AA? (laughs) We're getting more impressive all the time. It's frightening. I have an apology to make, too, to anyone who may be here because of the newspaper story in yesterday's papers, which told about uh, a high-powered executive who was going to discuss a community problem. She ain't here. (laughs) So if you were uh, got into this room by that bait, you were got in under false pretenses. The only person up here is a girl named Marty, a woman, who is an alcoholic. And the only thing she's going to talk about is what alcoholism did to her and what AA has done for her. Sure, it's a community problem. Because no one lives alone. And everyone is a part of some community. And if they're a big enough problem, that's a community problem. I was a community problem, all right. And so was every other member of AA here. And there are so many more who aren't here yet that there isn't any question about the fact that there is a grave community problem in alcoholism. But this is a meeting of members of Alcoholics Anonymous. People who are alcoholics, to be sure, because once you are, you are for good. You don't get over alcoholism, as you know. You'll always have it. You can arrest it. You can hold it at bay. And by doing so, lead a completely normal and happy life. So long as you follow whatever precepts enabled you to arrive at that point of an arrested disease. But you are a group of alcoholics, members of AA, and your interest in coming to this convention is a personal one. It isn't in the community aspect of the illness, it's in the personal aspect. For that primarily is what AA is all about. It has to do with individuals. How to reach them, how to help them. And it has to do with what they in turn can then do to reach and help other individuals. And thank God it is like that. I don't think anything was ever more needed on the face of the globe. And the world waited a very long time for this answer to come. Alcoholism, you know, has been in existence just as long as mankind has, as far as we know. The origin of the first drink is lost in the mists of prehistory. Nobody knows 
when some primitive individual or tribe first discovered what fermentation did and first had the effects we all know so well from drinking a liquid that had been fermented. Nobody knows. But you can be darn sure that from that moment there were some who couldn't handle it. Certainly just as soon as history began to be recorded in writing, there were records of such people. There have always been alcoholics. There have always been some people who could not take alcohol, who couldn't manage it. And when you realize that that means for thousands and thousands of years, and that in all that time, they, nor anyone else, ever found a way to help them out of that mess until 1935. You will understand, I think, how extraordinary it was that Alcoholics Anonymous ever came to be at all. And although it came late in the history of the world, it came in time for all of us here, and for hundreds of thousands more to come. But think how many for whom it came too late. Someone in my office early this week gave me with great pride a little slim volume that a cousin of hers had discovered in a second-hand bookshop in Ohio. It was called The Inebriate, published in 1898. And I started to read it. It took very little time to read. And there it was. It could have been written yesterday or today by one of us. Only it didn't have a happy ending. It talked about what alcoholism was, how people suffered with it. And it suggested ways and means of approaching them. It was talking to doctors. It said that they had to have a real feeling for these people. That they had to meet them with affection, with understanding, and not with condemnation and hostility. That was written in 1898. From all that we can remember, those of us who are old enough to remember the early 1900s, I guess maybe one or two people may have read it. And if they did, they didn't follow it. Because certainly, when I was growing up, there was neither any knowledge of alcoholism available, nor was there any tender loving care lying around loose for alcoholics. I can remember occasionally in my early adolescence overhearing whispered conversations among the adults. Because it so happened, I now know, that one or two of the friends of my family were alcoholics. As a matter of fact, my father was. I cannot tell you how completely this was concealed from his own children. I never knew it until I came into AA, and at that time he had not had a drink in six years. And I did not know this. Nor did I know that the father of one of the little boys I'd grown up with, whom I called Uncle, was an alcoholic, although... I had heard this awful whisper, he drinks. Oh, sure he drinks. My grandparents drank, my parents drank. All of the adults that I knew in our circle drank. I couldn't understand why suddenly it was whispered. And why it had this awful portentous tone. What did it mean when they whispered, he drinks? I lived in a big city, 
And in every big city, there is an area that today we're inclined to call Skid Row. In New York, we call the Bowery. And Chicago, the big city in which I grew up, had such an area. It's West Madison Street there. And I knew, as a young girl, that this place existed because sometimes these men would kind of spill over the edges and they'd be on the business streets where you might be downtown shopping, dirty, disheveled, unshaven, begging, begging for a dime for a cup of coffee and smelling. Oh, my God, how they smell. And if you gave them anything, you dropped it, hoping you wouldn't touch them. I knew these men drank, and I knew they drank too much. I knew they were drunk. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what kind of men they were. I knew what they looked like. They certainly were nobody I could ever know. And they were always men. What I've just told you was the sum total of the knowledge that I had of alcoholism when I grew up. I grew up in Prohibition. And during Prohibition, it was smart to drink, as you all know. All of you were old enough to remember. At least in certain parts of the country, and I lived in one of those parts of the country, in the big city. My father had laid in a tremendous stock when Prohibition went into effect, so there was never any shortage in my home. And when I started going out on dates at 16 or 17, by that time, a boy would as soon go out without his pants as without his flask. Any boy that was worth having a date with had a flask in his hip pocket. And having drinks, going to clandestine roadhouses that were also speakeasies, And getting hold of our family's prized stock of good liquor for parties was a part of growing up. You know, when I first came into AA, I always used to say that I had been a social drinker for the first ten years of my drinking. I believed it. Actually, I hadn't had any too serious trouble in the first ten years of my drinking. But as I began to learn a little more about what alcoholism really was, and perhaps also as the honesty part of the program began to take real root in me, and I became able to look back, not in a kind of golden glow of uh, wishful thinking recollection, but in an accurate Recollection, looking back at it as it really was, not as I dreamed it might have been or had been, I noticed some things about my drinking. Any of you have heard me say this before. I think it needs saying. I don't believe I ever was a social drinker, even though I wasn't getting falling down drunk every time I drank during those first ten years. And there are specific reasons why I think that. I was an exceedingly shy young girl, but that's not unusual. If you stop to think of it, the bulk of adolescents who are beginning to grow up are shy. They're a little fearful about going out into the world and meeting strange people, getting away from the shelter of their family. Some of them show it and some of them don't, but most of them feel it. I was tongue-tied, terrified of being a bump on a log or a wallflower or a wet blanket at a park. Now, I think nine out of ten girls have that same feeling when they're growing up. The dearest desire of any young girl is to be popular, to be well-liked, to be accepted. And I didn't feel a part of these groups. I didn't feel that people liked me. I didn't feel I belonged. 
I don't know why, but that's the way I felt about it. And then I discovered alcohol. And the first thing I realized about it, it wasn't the first drink I ever had, incidentally, because, as I said before, my family all drank, grandparents and parents. And as far back as I can remember, at Sunday dinners and Christmas and New Year's and events that were held at my grandparents, I always had a little tiny glass of wine. On Sunday night suppers, a little tiny glass of beer. And at the end of a big event like Thanksgiving or Christmas, a little tiny glass of creme de menthe, which I particularly liked because it tasted just like a chocolate mint. I had no reaction to any of those things. I never had any more than just that. But the point is that I had tasted alcohol in tiny quantities for a long time without noticing it one way or the other. But when I started going out on dates and to parties, then alcohol was something different. And by that time, as I said, it was prohibition and it was strong alcohol. It was whiskey and gin or brandy or what have you, whatever anybody happened to have. Very early days of prohibition, it was more likely to be good than it was later. And this was magic. This was absolute magic. Instantly, after a good stiff swallow out of somebody's flask, my feeling of being apart from things and not belonging and being tongue-tied and being uncomfortable and being frightened disappeared. Well, I don't think that is as unusual as some people in the technical literature are trying to make it. I think most people discover that out of alcohol, and I think that's why most people drink. I think it's one of the very valid reasons for drinking and serving liquor at parties, for instance. Makes people more comfortable and easy, and they have a better time. So that isn't particularly what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what I did when I discovered that. For I realized that uh, when the boy arrived to pick me up and we'd go out in his car, it might be 15 minutes or half an hour before the time for the flask came or before we arrived at the party where the drinks would be available. And all that time, I was going to be tongue-tied and uncomfortable and miserable. And here in my own home, my father had every kind of liquor easily available on the sideboard and elsewhere. And why should I wait? So at the age of 17, when I first began to drink, I did what I thought was an extremely intelligent thing. I had a couple of snifters out of my father's supply before I went out on my date. I was already feeling fine. It never occurred to me to mention this to anybody. It never occurred to me that it was odd, except, of course, I knew I was brighter than most people. But anyone who was reasonably bright should get that idea. It was just good common sense. This was not normal thinking. I know now. The second thing I discovered was that one drink did do it. It took two or three before I got that necessary relief. And so it was two or three that I had before I started. I didn't know then that that wasn't exactly normal. What one drink did for other people, it took two or three to do for me. I had an abnormal reaction to alcohol from the word go. And the third thing I didn't recognize, because I never heard of it, and had no way of knowing how odd it was, merely because I didn't think, I very quickly gained the reputation of being able to drink everybody else under the table. 
of being able to drink extremely well. I showed no signs whatsoever. And it was said I could drink more than anybody and not show it. And do you know I'd been in AA for 10 years before I realized that if people said about you that you could drink more than anybody, obviously you had been drinking more than anybody. I just never thought of it. So right from the beginning, I drank more than anybody. And this is not exactly normal. So from where I sit today, I do not believe that I was ever a normal social drinker. However, I had no appallingly awful effect from it for about ten years, and I didn't have bad hangovers. And I didn't show any signs of being drunk and disorderly, so to speak. I took everybody else home. I always was the one to drive the car. I know enough now to know that that was very dangerous. You don't have to be visibly drunk to be dangerous behind a wheel, but I didn't know that. Looking back, it is quite appalling how much I didn't know. And when at the end of ten years, this ability of mine, this fantastic ability to outdrink everybody and show no signs, and to drink consistently day after day with no apparent ill effect and no bizarre behavior and nothing to apologize for or explain away the next day, when this began to change very subtly, in my 27th year, after I'd been drinking for about 10 years, I had the faintest idea what was happening. Even then, at the age of 27, I'd never heard the word alcoholism. I didn't know what an alcoholic was. I had known a few people who drank an awful lot. I knew some slang words for such people. Most of them I was rather contemptuous about. In fact, I was very contemptuous about it. I divorced one. I thought he was a weakling. He couldn't drink the way I did. And any man that couldn't hold his liquor wasn't a man. You know, there are a great many people that still think that today. Far too many. And far too many who still don't know any of the things I didn't know way back then. Not knowing that cost me five years out of my life. And agonies that there isn't much use going into. But from the time that that change began to take place and I started to have blackouts, I didn't know what those were. I thought they were due to a fall, which had given me a concussion, and couldn't understand why they didn't go away instead of becoming more and more frequent. I couldn't understand why I had such appalling hangovers, so much worse than anybody else's. I was so ignorant by the, that by the time it had arrived at a point where I was, uh, I had finished moving through groups of people who spoke to me about my drinking. I was now moving through cities. And on one of those moves where I was uh, changing everything, you know, and it was going to be all right, I decided not to drink in this new city and in this new job, at least until I got settled in. It was the first time that I can recall, I'm pretty sure it was the first time I had ever quit, absolutely. Well, I had no trouble stopping but the most awful things happened to me. I had the cold sweat. I had the shake. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I was in a strange town in England, is where I lived then. And I went to the local doctor and described my symptoms. And he said, why, you must have some tropical disease. <laughs> And he gave me some medicine and told me to stay in bed two or three days, and uh, he was a brilliant doctor. He didn't know what kind of a disease I had, but he cured it. Two or three days, I was fine. I had the faintest idea 
of what happened to people who had been drinking the amount I had for many years and who suddenly stopped. I didn't know that there was such a thing as withdrawal symptoms, which is what I'd been having, and neither did the doctor. Of course, I didn't tell him how much I'd been drinking. I didn't know why that should enter in. But in any case, at that point, I had arrived way beyond the point of no return. I was no longer, although I didn't know it, even in the middle stages of alcoholism, I had entered the last stage. In my very just turned 30, as a matter of fact, because the progression for me from the time that the change took place where I no longer could manage my drink, for it was managing me, until the point where I couldn't stop, where I had blackouts almost all the time, where I didn't remember where I'd been or what I'd done or what I'd said, where I began to have rubber legs, and so when I would get up to leave somewhere, I'd fall flat in my face. All of the things we know so well and that are so humiliating and so horrifying to us. I had reached this stage by the time I turned 30. And I had reached it in a state of complete and utter ignorance about the subject of alcoholism. I didn't know what in the world was wrong with me. I didn't know why I was doing it. I began going to doctors then. Not just the one who told me I had a tropical disease, but because I was so convinced that there was a crack in my mental makeup, I started going to psychiatry. I went to many. This was in 1934, 1935, 1936 in England. None of them knew. None of them used the word alcohol. None of them told me that the thing I had to do was to stop drinking. Oh, they talked about anxiety neurosis. They talked about overworking, burning the candle at both ends. They talked about how much good it would do me if I went to a nice, quiet sanitarium for a few weeks. Some of them talked about how good, how much good it would do me if I were psychoanalyzed, which I couldn't afford and didn't have time to do anyway. But no one said anything about drinking. And I want to make a point here. I wasn't concealing it because I didn't know enough to conceal it. I was telling them that it was the way I drank that worried me. I was explaining to them that this was crazy because I did it when I didn't want to. I can remember one of those latter years When a big event was coming up, it was a party that had been talked about for months that everyone was looking forward to, including me. I was delighted that I'd been asked to it. Couldn't wait to get there. And, of course, I started preparing during the afternoon. I do not remember even arriving at the party, and I spent the night under the coat. In the room where people left their coats, I passed out just as soon as I got there. Now, nobody does this kind of thing because they like it. I didn't want to miss that party. This kind of thing happened all the time. I'm not going into gruesome details. I can tell as many as anybody else, and most of you know what they are. But what I'm talking about now is what was happening inside me at this time. I began, before I even drank, with a sense of not belonging, of not finding it easy to be a part of a group. And you can put that in one word. I didn't communicate easily and well with my fellow human beings, or they with me. But when I had some drinks, then I could communicate, and they could communicate with me. And so for about ten years, this was a wonderful kind of a telephone or radio. Put me in touch with people. It enabled me to be in touch with people. 
But as that change took place, and I began not to manage drinking very well, and those who were closest to me began to talk to me about it and suggest that I ought to go back to drinking the way I used to. And why didn't I drink like they did? And I was drinking too much. And I wasn't behaving very well when I drank. Immediately, those people were cut off, as far as I was concerned. I no longer could talk to them. I no longer could hear them. I spoke earlier of going through groups of people. I said once in a talk, I was living in London at the time, and I was in the kind of business that brought me in contact with many, many different groups. Photography and publicity, so that I had a great choice. And when one group would begin to look down their noses at the way I drank, I simply moved on into another group. Well, they should have kept me busy for many years. London's a very big city. But I went through that time like a dose of salt in no time flat. It was only a year or so before I had to get out of London. That wasn't big enough. It was just the biggest city in the world. What was happening was the doors were shutting. That I was being shut out and I was shutting them out. What was happening was that the prison, which is alcoholism, was beginning to close around. And by the time I finally arrived at help, and the first help that I had was from a psychiatrist, who put me in a hospital and then in a sanitarium. I remember the condition that I was in then. I'm talking about an internal condition. I had arrived at a point where I felt I didn't feel. I could hear, I could see. I could touch, but I couldn't see. My first hospitalization on the road back was in Bellevue Hospital in New York City. I was broke. I'd been almost in a continual blackout for a year. I had been dead drunk for a year. I was sick, frightened, shaken. And when this doctor, who was the eighth that I had gone to during that year, trying to find out what was wrong and trying to get help for what I didn't know what, except I was sure I was insane. So I went to head shrinkers, because that's where you go if you're insane. I happened to go to a whole string of completely honest, fine men who wouldn't take me on because they didn't know what to do with me and told me so. But they didn't tell me what was wrong. I don't think they knew. So I wasn't getting anywhere. That's why I have to keep going to more. And finally, the eighth one said I wanted so desperate to get well that he thought maybe he could help me. Although, he said, still without giving it a name, you are the kind of person who, in my experience, has one chance in a hundred. About one in a hundred of people like you get well. But you want to get well so badly that I believe maybe you're that one. And I'm going to do everything I can to help you, but you must go in a hospital. I was only too glad. And since you're broke, I'll get you into Belgium. Not in the psychiatric section, because you are not insane. He kept telling me I didn't believe him. I thought he was being kind. But in the neurological ward, he was a neurologist. He was in charge of that ward. And so I went in to the neurological ward at Bellevue, which had 34 beds, where a good many of the patients had brain tumors, spine tumors, quite a number with epilepsy. One or two had what they used to call alcoholic neuritis. And if that goes on untreated long enough, 
you are permanently paralyzed. There were two women in there paralyzed from the waist down. They don't call it that anymore. They call it polyoneuritis, and they know it comes from vitamin deficiency, vitamin B deficiency. But it used to be associated with drinking, and it was called alcoholic neuritis, and it was one of the terrible things that happened to a great many alcoholics. Anyway, with good behavior, I worked my way in that ward from the inside down to the end overlooking the East River. And I used to lie there because they woke us very early in the morning and watched the sunrise over the East River, which was very beautiful. And I have always loved beauty, and I would look at it and I'd think, isn't it nice? I wonder why I don't feel anything. And there were some very nice women desperately ill in that ward whom I wanted to like. And I did like. And yet I never felt that I could really talk to them or have any real contact. I had become cut off from contact. And later, when I finally got into a sanitarium and I was discussing this with a psychiatrist, trying to tell him how I felt, I... I used a phrase to describe it that many AAs had told me rang a bell with them, that they knew what I meant. I said, look, it's as if I was in a glass box. I can see out of it. I can hear. You can see me. You can hear me. But there is no contact. I don't see you. And I don't hear you down here. I only hear you with my ears on the outside. You know, that's a living death. We're zombies. We are no longer a part of the human race. And in that glass box, even though you can see, even though you can hear, you know a loneliness that cannot be described. Every alcoholic I know and to whom I have talked about our mutual feelings has told me of that feeling of loneliness, of being cut off. And so one of the things we know, we who are AA, that we must have if we are going to live is to be once again a part of the human race once again able to communicate and to be communicated with. I think for me the first indication of what AA meant came not from the book, although something tremendous had happened to me because of that, but came when I went to my first meeting, terrified, not knowing what I was going to find, not knowing who was going to say what or what kind of people they were going to be. And when I discovered that it was the easiest thing in the world for me to talk to these men, I didn't have any feeling of being outside or of being blocked off. I had the feeling instead that they were inside my head, that they could finish my sentences for me and I could finish theirs. I was communicating, and they were communicating with me. Bill took this as his theme at the convention in Long Beach and remarked on the extraordinary thing that we had in AA, this this ability to communicate. But he wasn't talking about it from the point of view of what it means to the new person coming to AA that sometimes for the first time in years, they are able to communicate. I knew before that evening was over, the evening on which I met the first AA members I ever met, that I had rejoined at least that segment of the human race, that I belonged, that I was with other people with whom I could talk and with whom I could speak. And you know, communication is not just a matter of words. It isn't just something that comes off the top of your head. 
Haven't you had times when you were reading, but your attention was a little distracted or you were terribly tired, and you read a whole page and you suddenly realized you hadn't known one word you'd read? There had been no communication. Yet your eyes had followed the words all down the page. Your mind knew the words you were reading, but it didn't say it made no impression. You didn't feel it. And this is a measure of how important feeling is in communication. To me, it is all important. Sure, I was communicating as far as the rest of the world knew all the time I lived in the glass box. They heard my voice. I heard their voices. We talked. I did things with people, and I had conversations with people, and I had so-called friendships with people. But they were all at a level that is about one hundredth of an inch on the surface of your head. They weren't down here. And this is all that matters. Words don't matter one bit if you don't feel them. Even actions don't matter very much if you don't feel them. People can do dreadful things to you, and if you don't care, what difference does it make? If you don't feel it, if you don't feel anything about it. And most of us in our alcoholism arrive at the point where we don't care, because we can't feel. And every once in a while we realize this, and it is the most desperate feeling in the world, because it's not in your control, there's nothing you can do about it. You're lost. You're lost. You have no base. There is nothing solid under your feet. You can put your arms out. There's nothing you can lean against or touch. You're in a vacuum. You're in nothing. This, I think, is what happens to people who are completely separated unto themselves. Man was not made to walk alone. Human beings were not made to live in a vacuum with nothing but themselves. Life itself is an interaction. It is a matter of what happens between people, and to lose that is to lose life. And this is what alcoholism took away from us. And this is what AA gave back to us. Not just in that form. I spoke of, of how I realized what that meant when I went to my first meeting and met other people with whom I could communicate at a level that had no bottom. Communicate at depth. Really hear and feel what they said. And know that they were hearing and feeling me in the same way. This is a very rare thing. There are many people that don't ever experience it to the extent that we do. Because out of the complete loss of it and the lack of it that we have had through our alcoholism, our appreciation of it, our need for it is so much greater than most people that I think we experience it to a far greater degree than the average person. And this, I think, makes us very fortunate people. So this is a wonderful thing, to be able to communicate at that deep level with other human beings, to talk to them and to hear them in that way. But that, as I said, is not all. For if it were, it might not be so permanent. It might pass. It would certainly run into all kinds of difficulties. For there are times when those we love the most, we are unable to communicate with, or they with us. Since we are all very imperfect, we human beings, we can't keep this thing up on the same level or at the same pitch all the time. We fluctuate, we go up and down. And we might lose our faith that we have regained this ability to communicate. We might lose our belief in other people. We might lose 
love and friendship. Because of this fluctuation, if that was all we had. But there's something else. And a sense of self-sufficiency, despite what I was going through and had gone through with alcoholism, that did not permit me to accept the idea that I had to bow down to a God or ask God for help or admit that there was a God. And so as I started to read the book which my doctor had given me and told me I must read, it was still in manuscript, it hadn't been printed, I became very angry for my hopes had been buoyed very high. In the opening pages of the book where I discovered a name for what I had. That's where I discovered I had alcoholism. That's where I discovered that alcoholism was a disease and that lots of other people had it too. And no one ever loved that word like I did. I have always found it a little difficult to understand people that boggled at the use of the word alcoholism or at calling themselves an alcoholic. I was so delighted to be called something and not just a nut that I couldn't have liked the words better and I still do. Incidentally, they're perfectly good scientific words coined by a scientist to describe a condition which he considered a disease and the people who suffered from it. He was Swedish. His name was Magnus Hutz, and he invented the word alcoholism in 1848 because he was tired of using a descriptive term which was continual drunkenness. He felt this was a disease, it was a scientific problem, and it needed a scientific name, and the name was alcoholism. And other people... Other scientists agreed with him and took the name up, and that is how it came into use. Alcoholism and alcoholic are not slang words. They are not words of opprobrium. They are scientific terms describing a condition, a condition of illness or disease. That's something to remember when you're talking to someone who cannot accept uh, being called an alcoholic or the word alcoholic or the fact that they have alcoholism. In any case, this part of the book was wonderful. I was very grateful for it. I liked it. I wanted more of it. And then to my horror, those capital letters started dotting the page, and here was God. And it all seemed to have to do with God, and this I did not like. And so I began arguing with my doctor about it. And every day I would read a little bit and I would go down and tell him what a lot of nonsense this was and that I didn't uh, go for that kind of hypnotism, self-hypnosis, the opiate of the people, hysteria, and all the other things I could think of that I'd read or heard over the years against God and religion and everything to do with it. And this went on for many weeks. And then, fortunately for me, and I no longer think by accident or coincidence, a situation arose which produced the kind of crisis that is described in our book as necessary. I was in a state of crisis. I was in a situation about which I could do absolutely nothing, which to me was completely horrible, for which I felt guilty and responsible, and I was helpless, and I was so angry that I was ready to kill, and I mean that. I literally saw red. I had never known that was anything but a literary phrase. It isn't. There was a red haze in front of my eyes. Everything looked a little red. And on my bed was lying this manuscript, open. I wasn't looking at it. But my eye fell on it, and in the middle of the page there was a sentence. 
which to me looked as if it were carved out in block letters and standing up. And that line read, We cannot live with anger. No one could have been in a greater state of anger than I was in at the moment that I saw it. And that was it. I don't know why. That was the battering ram that knocked my resistance down. And the next thing I knew, I was on my knees beside my bed. I think I'd been there quite a while, for the bedspread was wet for my tears. And I raised my head to a sense of freedom such as I had never known. I was free. I wasn't in prison. I was in a little room on the third floor. And I knew I could walk out that window and keep right on walking, that I wouldn't fall. I knew it. It's a very difficult thing to describe a feeling like that. It's all pervading. It's amazing. And it's indescribable. And it's wonderful. And I believe. And there was the first beginning of healing the separation between me and not only other human beings, but between me and the reason for all human beings, the creator of us all. And once that separation is healed, then indeed you have a basis on which to stand. Then you have solid ground on which to plant your feet. For you know then where you are, who you are, why you are, and where you're going. You are an instrument. You are a part of divine creation. There is a reason for all this, whether you understand it or not. But you are a part of it. You belong. These were the kind of thoughts that came to me then. They were the kind of thoughts that have stayed with me ever since. And these thoughts are the basis of my approach to AA and of what AA means to me. The fellowship that we gain by our communication with each other, I think, is a part of this. For I believe that we feel God, if you wish to use the word, or divinity, through each other. I believe that when we try to follow this program, based on an acceptance of ourselves as a part of divine creation, based on acceptance of belief in a power greater than we are which made us, and of which we are a part, then we are able to communicate with other human beings who are also a part of that great. And so long as we feel this, and so long as we can communicate, and so long as we know that we are a part and we do belong and we have a reason for being, then we can grow. Then we can grow, then we can do things about ourselves, for we know it's worth doing. So many of us felt unjustified. We we were worthless. We didn't know why we'd been born. We wished we had. But when you believe, when you know there is a reason for your being born, for God didn't create us as a joke, there is some reason then you know you are worth something. You know you are material which is meant to be something very wonderful, providing you help it to be. I disagree with one of the statements with which every meeting is open. I disagree with it merely because I think another one should follow it. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help others to achieve sobriety. Primary, yes, because without that, we have nothing. 
Nothing else is possible. Primary. But let's remember it's primary, not total. AA's total purpose is more than that. If all we did was to get sober, if that was all that AA offered us, and all that we received from it, I do not think we would take the trouble to get together in these meetings, to which people come from many states and over great distances. I do not think that those of us who have been in AA for a long while would still be coming to meetings and still caring desperately about it. I do not think we would have grown as we have grown. For there are many ways of just getting sober. Maybe it doesn't last, but a drunk in the last stages can get sober for a month or six weeks or sometimes for two or three years. Sobriety alone is not it. It's the kind of sobriety and what you do with it that matters. How do you use your sobriety? Is it a good sobriety? Is it growing? And are you putting it to the best possible use? Are you living up to your own potential? Are you, now that you are sober, becoming the kind of person you wanted to be, you dreamed of being, and that you know in your heart you can the tools that AA gives us are the tools with which to achieve this, not just the bride. We can't do these things without the bride. That's surely true. But we cannot afford to accept sobriety as our sole and total goal. For if we do, I think we will not keep it. Not only must we give it away, but we must make what we have to give away better all the time. We must start growing again where we stopped when alcoholism caught up. And if you stop to think, you will remember that your emotional growth, your growth as a human being stopped when your drinking got out of control, just like a needle got stuck in a record. This, I think, is why they call us immature, emotionally immature, because most of us started to drink too much when we were quite young. And at that point, we stopped growing emotionally. So when we stop drinking, we have to start from there. And emotionally, we may be only 15 or 17 or 18, although our bodies and our minds are in their 30s or 40s or even 50s. We have to grow. AA has given us the tools with which to do that. If we use AA, if we use all that it gives, and I think it is the most priceless gift that anyone could hope to have, then we in turn will be able to pass this on and make this priceless gift available to others. I believe that what we have in AA and in our way of life, not our sobriety, Incidentally, most people have that without crying, don't forget. To the non-alcoholic, this is not such a remarkable thing. It is to us. It should be. But to the non-alcoholic, much that we have is remarkable. Our way of looking at things, our faith, our communication, our feeling for each other, our ability to express not just friendship, but really love. Our caring for each other. These are things for which the whole world is hungry. For which all mankind yearns. We have it. We have a great, great gift. Conceivably, this gift of ours may help others, even though they are not alcoholics. I have heard many non-alcoholics speak of what it meant to them to really know a member of AA, to be near, to work with, 
or in many cases just to be able to go to meetings as a guest. This makes us very responsible, it seems to me. We have a responsibility, I think, not just to alcoholics, but to all men, to show them what living like this can mean. To show them what a life openly and frankly based on a spiritual belief which we not only live up to but talk about freely and care about and try to entreat what this kind of a life can do. The world's in a rather sad state. It's almost in as sad a state as we were when we were drunk. And AA saves us. Perhaps the example that we can give the world may one day save the world. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.